Welcome back to another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today, I'm joined by a special guest. His name is Dennis DeMori. He's a prolific personality on Twitter. He's got a newsletter, a YouTube channel. Uh, so he's a guy that's out there, really interesting to watch another sort of freelancer entrepreneur. I think we're going to have a great discussion today. Dennis, how's it going, man? Going well. So how would you uh, describe yourself to the people? Email marketer, consultant, uh, <laughs> tell us. Yeah, man, I, I, I'm one of those guys who has a bunch of stuff in his title now because I'm not doing just one thing. So uh, I'm an email marketer for my clients. I am also a, a mentor and coach for my students. And I also create my own info products. So I'm doing a few different things. That's awesome. And it, that must be a lot of work because you're maintaining things across a lot of different platforms. Uh, definitely takes a lot of drive to keep doing it every day and to be able to, to task switch as well and to move from, you know, different types of content creation and, and things like that. How do, you, how do you manage to do it all? Yeah, it's not too bad because I've been doing this for a few years now. I started freelancing online in early 2017, mm -hmm. um, actually a little bit before that. So it's been about five, five and a half years now. And as far as getting things done, though, um, I just try to, to batch everything I do. So uh, on Monday, it might be more content creation and planning uh, on Thursdays like today. It'll be podcasts like we're doing or um, uh, talking to students or uh, client calls. I try to batch things together and that mm -hmm. makes it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, man. Um, so why don't you give us a little bit of your background, sort of, uh, you know, share what you want, but just sort of how you maybe got started, where you grew up, uh, how you got started, may I'm guessing maybe in the corporate world and then. I uh, decided to branch out into more entrepreneurial activities. So love to hear about that. Yeah. So let's see. I, uh, I did the, the nine to five for about 12, 15 years. So I'd worked in finance. I worked in the mortgage business and then I worked in advertising and uh, I always wanted to run my own business, but I just didn't know uh, what to do. Uh, so I started freelancing, uh, I think it was maybe 2015 or 16 for some ad agencies and, uh, kind of flipped the switch in my head. Cause I was like, this is way better than, uh, having to, uh, be in the office all the time or just being committed to a company all the time. So I really like the flexibility. And then I got into some web design and content writing and finally copywriting and kind of like found my calling. So I'd always liked marketing. I liked uh, writing and it seemed like a good fit for my skills. So that was like early 2017 that I went all in and I've been doing this stuff ever since. But one of the big motivators for me was being able to travel and being able to set my own schedule, not having to go to the office, not having to commute, uh, not having a boss and do, do those types of things or dealing with office politics. I, I really hated all that stuff. So I just wanted to, to have more flexibility and freedom and options in my life and my lifestyle. And I wanted to build my life the way I wanted it to be instead of being kind of uh, trapped in one way of living. And, um, so that was a big, big driver for me. And I finally got to do it, um, around, uh, well, things started to come together. I, I think it was early 2018. I, when I booked a one way flight to Mexico city and, uh, that was the beginning of about two years of traveling and living abroad while I was working and growing my business. And that was like uh, a huge personal win because it's something I want to do for the longest time. And uh, it never would have been possible if I was still 
uh, working in an office like I did for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So how, how long did you have that dream to travel and work remote prior to, you know, packing a bag and booking a flight? I don't know. I'd, I'd always liked the idea of travel and the idea of exploring since I was a little kid. Like I remember seeing a, we had a big map in the hallway of uh, my home, uh, my parents' home when I was a kid. And I would look at that map and like see all the, all the countries around the globe and, and look at the cities and think of how cool it would be to go, go there and be able to visit and see what it was like. And I, I don't know when I got the idea in my head, but at, at some point I found out about business travel. So for a long time, I was like, oh, that'd be really cool if I could travel for business. Like I had a friend who was a medical device salesman. He was, he was always traveling from, from one hospital to another. So he was on the road and I liked mm -hmm. that idea. And I did a little bit of that with some, uh, like in the mortgage business, um, which was like late 2000s. Um, but then I found out about people like flying for business. And I thought that was like the coolest thing. And, and how eventually, you can maybe expense the flights. Yeah, that type of thing. So eventually I did that. I did that for a couple of years and I realized it wasn't as, as good as I thought it was going to be because it would be like coast to coast trips, but I'd only be in the city for like two days. Sometimes they have to go. And sometimes I go to, to cool places like New York city where there's a lot of things to do and see other times, not so much. And I realized that I just, uh, that type of travel was not everything was, I thought it was crack up to be because you were still working or it still had to be available for work. So uh, it was closer to what I wanted to be doing, but it was still, not what I was looking for. And uh, when I got into freelancing online, then it was, then I could see uh, other people doing it. And I heard about digital nomads and uh, expats and working online, all that stuff. And uh, I knew that that was what was going to allow me to do that. Yeah. I, I think I actually had a, a similar journey. And uh, I, I found the, the tweets I had in mind. Uh, I had tweeted, if you can figure out where remote work now, you can live location independent for the rest of your life. And uh, then you uh, retweeted that and you said, thanks to remote work, I was able to live in and visit over 20 city cities on four continents in two years. Never would have happened if I was chained to a desk. Yeah, true. So that's, that's, that's good. You, uh, four continents, 20 plus cities. Uh, what, what were some of the spots you hit? Well, uh, the first one was Mexico city. So I was there for about, I think about six or seven months on and off. And then I visited about other, another, uh, 10 or 11 towns and cities all over Mexico. Uh, and then I went further south to, to Colombia and Argentina, then Europe, and then uh, and then then Asia. But looking back, I would say that uh, Singapore, Prague, and and Vienna were, were some of the the best places I visited. Okay, and so how do you think about like Latin America versus Eastern Europe, Europe in general? Um, you know, if you're based up in Phoenix, Arizona for like, there's direct flights probably to 10 plus different cities in Mexico, other Latin American flights are super, super easy. Um, you're in a good spot for that. Yeah, I'm in Arizona and I, this is a tough question to, question to answer because a lot of guys will ask you like, Oh, what's the best place to go or where should I go? And it's like, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know what you like. I don't know what you don't like. So that's, that's an impossible recommendation, especially with so many places in the world uh, where you could go. But uh, I think definitely different regions will attract different types of people. Like the guy that really likes living in Eastern Europe, uh, like Ukraine, you know, not now, 
with the with the war situation. But but before the guy who's into that is probably not the same guy who's into living in uh, Medellin. Like they're very different, right? And the guy who likes uh, I don't know Mexico City might not really jive with Bali. Mm-hmm. So the only way to know that is to really know yourself and to also just get out there and, and book some flights and, and see what they're like. Because, you know, I, I don't know about other people. I watch a lot of these YouTube videos of other people traveling and I look at where they go and it's one thing to see it uh, online, but it's totally different way there. Like I'd, I'd watch stuff about Vietnam before going there. And then after spending a month in Vietnam, my, my view of it's totally different. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think at least for the, for Western guys, I think that, uh, Latin America is good because of similar time zones. Um, uh, also English, um, Spanish is fairly easy to earn, uh, learn versus learning like Russian or, or, uh, Vietnamese, like those are way harder. So, uh, Latin Latin is a good like kind of jumping off point for people to kind of dip their toes into it, and that's one reason I went to Mexico first because um, I was already like familiar with Mexican culture, already spoke some Spanish, so it wasn't that much of a, a, a culture shock for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a, a great place for a lot of people to start, but like if you're already in in Europe somewhere. Then maybe someplace like Prague or maybe or somewhere like uh, I don't know um, Estonia might be a better fit for you. So it just it's gonna that, it depends. Yeah, definitely makes sense. And then so you know you started in Mexico City, and I think w- one of the things that you know makes sense about Mexico as a first uh, destination is you you can go home like very easily like it's so non-committal for people like i really try to tell people like you don't have to you know it's not it's not four months or nothing you can just go for a couple weeks get the feel for it see what's going on you can lots of people just sort of like pop in pop home stuff like that um so dennis i had a question for you like so in addition to mexico city did you have any other favorite spots in mexico that you visited yeah, I, what was it? I, well, I, Guadalajara is all right. Um, uh, I like San Miguel de Allende, even though it is kind of touristy. Still, it's very pretty. It's really nice. It's a, it's a cool place to go check out, cool architecture. Uh, Guanajuato also, it's pretty close to San Miguel, so you might as well go see it. And that's interesting in a different way because that's more of a college town. So those are cool. I would also recommend Oaxaca. I really like Oaxaca City. So that um, that's a great city to explore. They also have a great um, restaurant scene there. And like you can get good food in pretty much any major city right around the world. But uh, Oaxaca has got kind of its own thing going on. So. Um, those are my favorites. Those are the ones that I would, I would definitely try to check out. Mexico City, uh, San Miguel, Guanajuato. Uh, I know a lot of guys like Guadalajara because of the girls and, and, and all that, but um, I don't think there is mu- as much to do in Guadalajara. Plus, it's very spread out. So is. you need a car to get around or just be okay with taking Ubers, um, to get around because you've got like the main street of Chapultepec, which is okay. It's a little bit like college-y and I'm, I was past that stage. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if you go by like, I think it's an Ansaris or Ansuris, um, which is kind of like the high end uh, spot. And there's, there's a mall over there. That spot is nice, but it's not walkable. So that's a, a big negative for me. I, I like being in walkable cities, and that's one of the reasons I like places like uh, like Prague or, or Vienna because you could just walk the entire city for hours and not have to rely on public transportation. For sure. I mean, I, I started doing like those sort of 
like walkability tweets. Um, <laughs> I, I've seen other people, uh, it, it's really popular. Like they'll, they'll just be like, uh, what will they, what will they say? They'll say like, like whatever, wh- whatever political affiliation this is, this is what I am. And then it'll be like a photo of like a streetcar. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's <laughs> like, it's super important and it's not something like, I don't think Americans get it. Uh, and people that don't travel a lot, I don't think they get it. But once you've lived in a walkable city, it really makes you think about that differently. And I, uh, I don't like having to rely on a car to get around. And I don't like having to have to, have to drive everywhere. Like it sucks because it's, it's um, I enjoy driving, but it, it's also kind of a waste of time. And it's so nice to live in a, in a neighborhood like Condesa in Mexico City and just be able to walk to wherever you want to go. Um, also way healthier, right? I mean, it, it's kind of insane. Like back home in the U.S., it's so hard to get 10,000 steps in a day. But anywhere else I was abroad from uh, Colombia to um to Kiev, I mean, everywhere I went, I was easily doing 15, 20, 25,000 steps every day. Uh, in, in Bangkok, I was doing like 30, 35,000 a day, <laughs> which is a lot, but uh, it's just so much easier. And in the US, unless you're somewhere like New York City, uh, it's, it's almost impossible. No, for so. sure. I think walkability is absolutely huge. And it's a big part of, um, I think one of the reason digital nomads expenses are so much lower than people back home is that, uh, is that we don't have cars and all these like car related expenses like parking uh, and, and things like that, maintenance, uh, gas. And so your, your expenses are just way lower because in Latin America or, New York, or in Europe, you just don't need a car at all. Um, and I enjoy living in cities that are, that are walkable. So even in the States, you know, I like Miami beach. I like Boston, uh, New York, San Francisco, places where, you know, I still don't need a car. Um, but it, it, it like, it, you could easily, I think like raise a family in Mexico, a family of four or five, seven, and just not own a car. And, you know, the, the, <laughs> the amount of like, you, you wouldn't even need, need to go to the store really, because there's so many people driving by your house, selling things, um, you know, blowing whistles and being like mangoes or bread or whatever that you could just live on things that people sell to your house door to door in Mexico. Yeah. It, it, it's, uh, it's kind of easy to live in, uh, in certain parts of, of Latin America. Like it's just like an easier way of life. And I was just thinking about Mexico city. Like I could walk, I could walk to the grocery store and the gym and the bar, uh, to go out. Like, uh, and if not, like I might take an Uber, like to go out on the weekend. And that would be like, I don't know, a $2 Uber. Uh, so certain things there are, are just, make things really easy for people to, to, to Get blend into the lifestyle like right away. So, so yeah, that's nice. And, uh, it's, it's seriously lacking in the U S like you do have cities like, like Savannah, uh, or Boston where, I mean, I, I used to live in Boston too. I used to walk all over the place. I walked a lot in Boston. But because uh, you have all the neighborhoods that are like right next to each other, right? Mm-hmm. Yep, but, Savannah and Charleston are good examples. Yeah, too. Savannah, Charleston. Uh, I've been to those those cities as well. But uh, m- most of the U.S., especially cities that are not on the on the coast, I would say, like Dallas. I forget it. <laughs> like you have to, you need a car, and and I, I'd say for. Mexico specifically, it's easy for a, 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 someone in the West, uh, in North America, in um, 
Canada, uh, the US, um, also like UK to go somewhere in Mexico and cut your cost of living at least 20% because your housing is going to be cheaper and uh, you're, you're not going to have a car. So you're not going to have any of those associated costs plus uh, cost of food is lower. And those are your big three, right? Those are your big three expenses. So I would say at a minimum, you're going to save at least 20%. And, uh, you know, that's, it's a big lifestyle upgrade for people, Mm -hmm. you know, now it's, it's different. I'm, I'm, if you are, I don't know, making a few hundred thousand a year, we have higher net worth. It's going to be a little bit different situation, but I know that a lot of the guys doing like the nomad thing or like in their, in their twenties, maybe not making as much. And what I would recommend to them, if they were interested in, in that kind of lifestyle, like you, I would much rather be somewhere in Latin America or, or Southeast Asia and cut my cost of living 20 to 30% while I'm building my business than be in like somewhere in the U S where I'm spending more money and I'm just not living as well. Like it just doesn't really make any sense unless you uh, need to be there for some reason, like family, uh, which is perfectly fine. But if you have the option, then you can, you can take advantage of the, of the geo arbitrage that a lot of people are doing because it does make a lot of sense. Right. And, and you're so well set up for it because um, I, I know you're aware of the, the foreign earned income exclusion. Have you ever yeah. considered uh, basically living outside of the States and taking advantage of that? Yeah. The, my issue is, is family. So I need to be where I am now to, to be closer to them. Uh, but if, if I wasn't in that situation, then I would definitely take advantage of it. Dude, if I were you, I would just go live in like Waimas. Um, send, you know what I mean? Like just right there in Sonora, anything happens, you can always pop back like quick drive back to Phoenix. What's maybe it's like six hours, eight hours <laughs> you can do that. Yeah. It, it'd be nice. It'd be nice. It's not possible right now. No, but, cool. I mean, and then, uh, like you've also, you, you're also aware of the idea of getting, you know, temporary or permanent residency in Mexico. You're aware of a lot of the, the flag theory concepts. Have you done anything in that direction to sort of um, internationalize um, yourself? Not yet. Uh, I do have a list of those things that I, I'm interested in. I've been looking into five flags for at least a few years now. I forget when I first heard about it. But uh, some of those things are on, on my list to do, like uh, citizenship by descent and um, maybe uh, – citizenship by real estate investment or maybe some offshore banks. Although I'm not, I'm not entirely convinced that I, that offshore banking is even as useful now with crypto because you would do all this work to set up uh, a bank in another country, but crypto is kind of doesn't have a country, right? So I don't know if there's that much of an advantage there. But I, I am really into the, the whole fi- five flags philosophy. And uh, whether you do all five or whether you do like two or three of the flags, I, I think that's something that a lot of people should consider because I really dislike the idea of uh, working for one company or having all my money in one country and, and those types of, of things. I think you want to have some global diversification to to have more options but also to protect your downside in case things go to shit definitely and uh i'm guessing that damori i'm not sure if that's just like a a stage name or if it's your real name but that's i imagine an italian last name which is one of the top citizenship by descent countries i don't know if you've looked into the italian program yeah i i hear they're very difficult I hear that that dealing with Italy is an enormous pain in the ass. So I don't know (laughs) if if that's something I want to deal with, but uh, I think they've got a 
a digital nomad visa they're working on. I think I heard about that recently. So maybe maybe Italy is not such a bad option. You know, they, they do have a couple things, but I'll tell you that the, the citizenship by descent through Italy, uh, it definitely takes a couple of years while you're waiting in, in, uh, for, for them to complete things on their end, uh, the processing. But it's very achievable and people do get a passport at the end of it. And all the, you know, Facebook groups dedicated to this, there's tons and tons of success stories of people getting their Italian passport. Uh, this uh, particular podcast host may or may not have received his citizenship by descent after, I want to say, I want to say uh, it, it was about four years, probably two years to gather the documents and then two years of waiting after the documents got submitted to the Italian consulate. Um, but it came through and it it's, uh, became a, you know, it's an important part of a, of a good strategy is to have probably like some kind of base in Europe. See, that is a long time. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I have the patience for that because I, because you, like you could, you could do uh, citizenship by investment in, in where like uh, Antigua and that's like a couple months. For sure. Right. And so, not, there are, so there are some that are much faster. Like you should get every one that you can. Right. Yes, the, the Itali Italian one does take a while, but I mean, it's not, it's like, you know, you, you're just collecting a bunch of birth certificates and stuff. It, it's not, you know, a big deal. And then, and then you're just waiting. So you don't have to spend time on the ground in Italy. Uh, you're just sort of going on with your life. And then this thing's like happening in the background. And that's sort of like, uh, you know, one of the more advanced strategies would is to have like a multiple processes happening at once. And so what I mean by that, and this is something I've, I, I've been thinking more and more about because I, I, I previously had more of like a one track mind where previously I was like, okay, five years, X, Y, Z country, and then another five, but really you can do, you can do like many processes concurrently as long as they have low physical presence requirements and i know that you've kind of seen some of the, some of that content on twitter before yeah and you make some good points so i think like what we're talking about though is really part of a much much uh bigger plan right the whole plan b idea uh of having five flags i've even heard of seven flags right people mm -hmm. people have different breakdowns of it but uh, there are certain lower hanging fruit um, that might be a lot easier like if you're in panama you can open up a foreign bank account and that's not too much of a pain in the butt to do uh, and there's going to be more advanced stuff or more expensive stuff, right? Like citizenship by real estate investment. If you're doing that in, mm -hmm. in some countries, you're looking at half a million dollars or more, which a lot of people don't have. So, uh, yeah, there are, there are, I mean, for guys that don't know too much about this stuff, I guess that's what I'm talking to right now. It's, you know, certain things are easier to do than others. Certain things are more expensive to do than others but you don't have to do everything and you can take your time with a lot of these things. And you need to think about like, how does that fit into your overall plan? Because the point is not to just collect passports. It's like, well, what does this other password do for me? Right? Like, what do I get out of it? Or what is, what is having an offshore bank account in Georgia do for me versus not having it? Right? So um, that's a big rabbit hole people can go down. Um, I've been reading up on this stuff and talking to people about this stuff for years now. So it's, uh, it's going to be a multi-year journey, most likely. Uh, mm -hmm. It's probably going to cost some money. But uh, to me, this is like, you, you can't really look, like become um, part of the, the digital nomad or even expat lifestyle which I'll think, without thinking about these, stuff, these things because I think they do... It occurs uh, to everyone. Yeah, it, it occurs to people. It's like, wait a minute. So I can make money from anywhere in the world as long as I have an internet connection. Huh. <laughs> right? And wait a minute. I can get paid in USD, but I can spend 
uh, money in, in pesos or, or bots or whatever other local currency, mm-hmm. huh, right? And it's like light bulb after light bulb. So that also happened to me. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> there is actually a better way of doing some of these things. And most people don't even know this is possible. So yeah, you start going down that rabbit hole and, um, it's, I mean, it's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's can be a, a, make a dramatic difference to your life. If you can get some of these, uh, pieces of the puzzle, uh, to where they need to be. Yeah. And I'd actually appreciate your, um, your thoughts on maybe what we could do at my Latin life. Um, kind of what your opinion would be because, um, I, 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 there's, there's no doubt that there's a huge need in the market for more nomad capitalist type services that can help people do this and make it more accessible to people. Um, I think like one of the other best examples right now is rebase.co, which is Peter level, like the nomad list guy, Peter levels company that's sort of creating an immigration as a service company. And they're trying to use software to sort of like, um, automate parts of the the immigration process such that, you know, it's as streamlined as possible for someone to apply to become a Portuguese resident and rebase is focusing on Portugal right now. But um, like you could easily write code to, to help, you could easily write, create like a software platform and write code to help people apply for citizenship by descent you know, to Italy or Ireland or whatever it is, you could create a platform to help people kind of do stuff. But then, you know, beyond just like a a software platform is like a little bit more advanced or even something more basic, like just a course. And then it's kind of like, how do you frame the course? Should it be like a general sort of like internationalize yourself type of course? Should I really focus on a, a specific country or do like more sort of holistic plan? Like, should I do sort of like like hyper hyper specific service and be like, you know, we can get you Paraguay residency. Like for sure. That's what we do. 3k bing, bam, boom. Or should it be more like comprehensive international? Like, Hey, let's take a look at your whole, your whole vibe. Let's see where we can sort of like diversify you. So there's kind of like different approaches and I I go back and forth on what would be uh, the most helpful and attractive to people. Yeah, well, you can do all of the above. <laughs> That's like with nomads and expats, I think the main things to think about are where is the friction right now? Like what are people complaining about? What if like Ty Lopez said this, which is what if people say like I wish blank, right? I wish I could uh get citizenship in Paraguay more easily. I wish I could, um, I don't know, have, have cell phone service anywhere I go. Uh, so like you got to look at what are those problems that are just like begging to be solved right now. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a lot of them, right? Uh, because the, the, like the whole nomad expat scene is is a whole industry of things, right? It's not just it's not just citizenship. It's also uh, travel, travel gear, um, how to be productive as you're traveling. Um, then all the five flag stuff. Then um, retirees, homeschooling. Oh yeah, that that's that. Oh yeah, that's. I don't know how big it is, but to me, that is kind of like where the puck is going because you have nomads who are like in their 20s who are now getting older and they're in their 30s or they're in their 40s like I am and they're starting to have families. So they like that lifestyle, but they don't know how to do it with two kids, right? So that's like a like a sub segment of like the nomad expat mm-hmm. population, mm-hmm. and those people have their challenges. Like, uh, do they? You know, I think a lot of them are going to be into homeschooling. Well, where do they go for that, right? So, um, 
those are all opportunities. But I would start small. I would start with a specific niche and then go from there. Because like you're not going to out nomad or like outdo nomad capitalists. Um, they've been around for, like 10 I don't years. know, 10 years maybe. Yeah. And he focuses on seven and eight figure entrepreneurs. So if you're not doing at least a million a year, he won't even work with you. Uh, so that is his niche. But you don't have to go after the same niche that he's in. There's plenty of other people that, that will pay um, for all kinds of help, like accounting, right? You mentioned FEIE. People want help with that stuff too. That's another idea I had was to make sort of like a like an expat software as a service that would do um, pro- basically folk, maybe a, one of the niches would be focusing on helping Americans who are going to file the FEIE and do like digital nomad tax returns and help them do that. Yeah. Because mo- most, most accountants can't do that. True, true. But I, I also know a couple accountants that or more than a couple who specialize in taxes for digital nomads. So there, there is that need and pro- it's probably going to grow as more people do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you also mentioned focusing on a specific country like Paraguay. I think that's an option as well. So, I mean, all of these are good ideas, right? But it comes down to the execution. It's like, what is that actually going to look like? You know, what is that, what is that business going to look like? Um, and all that stuff. So yeah, I think th- these are all like, good ideas. You know, there's different, yeah. I mean, it could be a, a, a course or a service. So I have a question for you, Dennis, because I mean, you, you do your own, you help people, I think, uh, if I understand correctly, help their, you help them craft their own high ticket sales programs and you coach other people who are going to be doing high ticket stuff, right? That is part of what I do. So I have, I guess you could break down my business into three categories. So I work with clients one-on-one and I help those clients with their email marketing. And usually that includes their, uh, their copywriting and uh, their email marketing strategy and their offers, right? Those offers might be low to high ticket. So Mm-hmm. I might consult with them on their high t- on building a high ticket offer or uh, improving a high ticket offer, so no more people want to buy it. So there's like that's one piece. The other piece is training. So training other freelance email copywriters to do what I do with clients. So that's another part of my business. Mm-hmm. So and I have my students. Um, and they're in my paid community. Although I'll, I'll talk about that stuff in social media and with my email email list as well and then the third part of it's like the education component which are uh ebooks courses workshops like all those types of training products so that's how i how i see my business in those three different categories um and uh i do all three so i don't exclusively do one i I do doing all three of those things um all the time so my, my my business is kind of diversified that way that's good yeah, yeah, but uh, I mean, for anyone, it, I, I think the the way to get started is to start small. You got to pick some type of niche, and there's different ways to niche down. You can niche down a specific market, right? Like people who uh, are older digital nomads with families or expats, and they want to continue that lifestyle. That's target. Um, could also be a specific pain point, right? Pain point could be. Um, how to get citizenship in uh, in Paraguay, right? As as easily as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, but there's a, I mean a million different things you could do. I think it's thinking about what your audience would most want to buy from you. For and sure. that comes down just, to research. A, it's true. It's true, and and just some some conviction as well. So uh, let me let me put one question to you. So in your professional opinion, when you look at Nomad Capitalist and you look at sort of their uh, their portfolio of products, so they have the Nomad Capitalist book, which is like a hardcover book, and then they have the um, basically like the full scale service that's like twenty grand, roughly. I don't know, fifteen, twenty, thirty k, and he gives you like a full comprehensive plan, and he's like. He's like, boom, Montenegro, Armenia, 
Colombia and gives you like this whole crazy like worldwide plan. Uh, and he's and, and you know it's 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 everything. But he's he's not really chopping out any individual services. He has no other courses. There's no like you know move to Malaysia guide or or something like that. It's it's just like the twenty dollar book or the twenty thousand dollar service for seven figure entrepreneurs. I'm just curious why you think he chose to um, to segment his business that way. Oh, I don't know. I don't know, but that there are like his business model is mainly done for you right so that's his high ticket um, i mean actually it's not just the stuff you mentioned right he has his his book so that would be his low ticket offer he also has his done for you service which i think is like uh yeah around that 30k um, ballpark for an action plan and then you have mm-hmm. to spend the money to actually get it done Mm-hmm. Right, because um, it, it costs money for for lawyers and all these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also does his events, which are yep. not cheap, which are like yep. a couple thousand bucks at least. So that is what seems to, I'm guessing, make sense for his audience and for what he wants to do. But you can look also at uh, Sovereign Man, where he tends to talk more about investment opportunities. So he'll talk about gold, he'll talk about agriculture in Chile. Mm -hmm. um, And, and the business uh, model is different. His is more about uh, a subscription model. Yeah, that's uh, more like the Agora subscription model. Yeah. So you're you're getting access to to information. Uh, And then you have Caleb Jones with, with his sovereign CEO, who is targeting the younger guys, like guys who are in their 20s, getting them to 70K or 85K a year in annual income. Um, so he's not targeting expats. He's not targeting guys with families. He's not targeting multimillionaires. Mm-hmm. Totally different target. And all of those are, are good um, good ways to, to approach this whole, uh, this whole category. So, yeah, there's there's no there's no right answer. That's for sure. Yeah, there's no right answer. It's re- it, it it comes down to the execution. They're, they're all those are all good ideas. They're all those those are three viable ways to do it that are working for all those guys. Uh, and I mean, it's I, it's it's wide open. Like I don't I don't think anyone's really like the the market is too big for anyone to corner. That's why you have guys uh, targeting people in different ways, right? From the multimillionaires down to like the nomads who are uh, maybe just starting their first online business. Mm -hmm. So short answer, it depends. What I'm realizing is I think the digital nomads kind of want to do it all themselves. Um, They're happy to kind of like in, in you know in my experience as a young guy and I said I I have the time to in the competence to to read you know read everything that's out there and kind of do it all myself and then I'll just pay the lawyer or the fixer you know a thousand bucks to like do the one thing I can't do you know what I mean like as you know lawyer stuff but other than that like I didn't need my hand held and so I think that's sort of where digital nomads are at and then um there's a huge market of people that are like retirees that want to go to Costa Rica or Panama or Mexico, things like that. And I think those people maybe have more to spend. And then I don't know, there's, there's, there's definitely all, all different groups of people, but I think the bottom line is this isn't going away. More and more people are going to become location independent. I think there's going to be more migration at a global scale than ever before. I think people have been sort of like artificially locked in their nation states for like the past 100, 200 years was never really like that before that. And uh, things are going to become much more fluid once again now. Yeah. And you just, you got to ask yourself, like, do my, does my ideal client have more time than money or more money than time? Like a guy who's making 5 million a year uh, with his U S based business, like this guy does not want to go through an eight hour course. Right. 
He's like, dude, I'll just, I'll just pay you. Just pay you to get this done for me as fast as possible. I don't care if it costs more. Right? True. Uh, somebody who's not in a financial position might, might go through a course. It just, it just depends. Um, but like someone like Nomad, Nomad Capitalist, he's offering like a boutique concierge service for high net worth individuals. So totally different. It, it makes sense he doesn't have any courses. He's just got a book that's going to introduce you to his, uh, his business and his, his approach. He's also got tons of blog articles and, and YouTube videos if you want to go through that stuff. Mm -hmm. But after that, like, it's, it's a very high ticket type service. So um, I'm not even sure if it would make sense for him to have any, a, a type of course for the types of clients he's working with. So it, it's got to make sense for, for your customers, right? Thanks, man. That's helpful. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and uh, just talk a little bit more about what you have going on. Um, so I wanted to ask you, I mean, what would your advice be to people out there that haven't built a strong personal brand yet? They know that they need to buy their their URL. They know they need to start a Twitter. They need to buy ryansmith.com and get their at ryansmith Twitter and start building an email list and maybe start a YouTube channel and do all these personal brand things. Like what, what do you advise? Like I, you know, that's something that's not for everyone, but at the same time, everyone kind of should have, you know, a personal brand or, you know, authority, at least in a certain area, some sort of like public authority in, in the thing that they do. How, like, how do you, how do you think about that? And how do you, how did you make the leap into being more out there and, and trying to build your authority? And then what do you, what do you tell other people? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that everyone needs it. Like if you are a electrician in Kansas, like do you really need a personal brand on Twitter? Probably not. But for people that are interested in this type of, of uh, lifestyle, then a personal brand is only going to be an advantage, right? It's not going to, it's not going to hurt you. Um, it's probably going to be a big plus. But none of this stuff happens overnight. Like I've been doing this stuff since early 2017. Uh, so it's been over five years now and mm -hmm. it's just really plugging away uh, day after day, doing something that is going to, uh, to, to build your audience. I mean, that's really what it comes down to and having a, a couple, uh, simple, uh, platforms you can use to funnel people through so that they can become customers. So it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to be on six different platforms. You could very simply have a Twitter account and an email list and, and that's it. And then in, with your emails, you're going to talk about the types of problems that your, uh, your subscribers are dealing with and how you can help them. And that's like the easiest way you can do things and it is effective. You don't have to make it really complicated. So uh, the main thing though is, is to just get started because the time's gonna pass. And if you are interested in this type of lifestyle where you have more flexibility and you're okay with having the responsibility because it's not just, you're, it's not you doing nothing, like you still, are going to have the, the responsibility of, of doing these things. No one else is going to do them unless you hire people. And now, now that's a different conversation. Like I work alone. I have a, a VA who helps me once in a while, but for the most part, I work alone. So uh, in order to make this happen though, it's, it's been years of working with clients and talking to people and promoting myself and my business and, and my offers. So, uh, it does take time, but also it does get easier the longer you do it. So sure. that's why I'm not working, uh, 70 hours a week, like some people, um, also because I don't need to for my business model, but yeah, the longer you do it, the easier it's going to get. 
And as long as you have those main things, like a, a, a way to, to get in front of people, a way to promote your services or, or your, your products, then as long as you have those, those basic things, then you can do pretty well. Mm-hmm. And so Dennis, I'm going to, I'm going to admit something to you here because I need your help once again. And that is that, um, I still don't understand email marketing. Um, you know, I've listened to lots of podcasts from niche pursuits and, and those guys, you know, micro business guys talking about build your email list, you know, have the, you know, have a flow sort of like a welcome sequence, five emails, this, this, and that, um, but as a consumer of email, I don't like I personally just don't really subscribe to any newsletters or 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 things like that unless it's like by accident. And when I do get that stuff, I don't really like I don't fall into the flow, I guess, quote unquote, like or I don't know. I just I, I don't I don't read long form emails. Um, and so for me, it's like I like for my Latin life, we have an email list. Um, and I almost just don't know what, like, I know what to do with it, but I don't know what to do with it. So I haven't even really been harnessing it like the past six months. Yeah. You just, you need to, um, forget about how you consume email and just think about how other people do. Cause a lot of people read emails and a lot of people buy through emails. So, uh, the main thing is just, uh, I would start with a very simple, promotional calendar and it could be a weekly email it could be three emails a week uh, but something that you could stick with and then uh, use that to talk about the problems that your your um, your audience is, is dealing with and how you can help them mm-hmm. and that's that's really uh, at its core that's that's what you're doing so yeah, you can do these things with, uh, with automations and stuff. And, and that those are, are good things to be able to do, but it's not even, it's really not that important in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't want to get lost in the weeds. Like main thing is you got to stay in front of people cause they're going to forget about you right out of sight, out of mind. And email mm-hmm. is still one of the best ways to do that. So mm-hmm. no, I, I get that it gets in front of people. So let me ask you about uh, frequency then, because I've heard different uh, numbers thrown around, like you said, one week or three times a week. If you're consistently emailing someone three times a week for for a year, like how are they not unsubscribing? That's what I don't get. Uh, different reasons. Maybe they, maybe they just uh, archive all the emails. Uh, maybe, maybe they do like what you're sending. Like I've had people that have been reading my emails for a couple of years now. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, it, it just depends if, um, if people are reading them, right. If they're opening and reading them, like, is it a topic that they're interested in? Right. Cause if you're, if you're big into golf and you're getting a, new, a newsletter about golf, like you want to hear about golf all the time. You want to hear about like, the latest gear you want to hear about how to hit the ball farther. Mm -hmm. Um, you want to hear about, uh, little, little tips and tricks you can use to beat your friends, you know, and you don't get stick about that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you got to find like your market crack. Like what are the things they always want to hear about? Like I was just watching some videos about backpacking and, backpackers are all about gear, right? What's the best gear? What's the best ultralight gear? So I'm not carrying a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. What's the best foods to bring? Um, Like, and people just never get sick of those topics. Like for me, um, no, go ahead. I was just going to say for me, like I can always talk about how to write better emails, how to make more sales with emails, how to get clients. If I'm talking to freelancers, like I could be talk, I like I, how to get clients. I can be talking about that 10 years from now. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. People are, are still going to open those emails. Do you think that the recipients of email marketing skew older than maybe like a traditional audience? Um, do you think that, you know, are we, are we reaching like teens or 20 or 20 somethings with email marketing or does it sort of reach sort of the, maybe the older segment of, of someone's given audience? Uh, I've heard it, it skews a little bit older, but I don't think that's really that big a deal. Like, Young people, they still need email, like for their Apple ID or to like get a confirmation email for things. So they're still using email. Uh, maybe not as much as, as like say Gen X, but uh, you still need email to do a lot of things. Like to just log, log into a website, you need an email address. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, no, this is helpful. And I, I am being a bit just like devil's advocate. Obviously, I know email marketing is super important, but I'm just sort of trying to think like what, uh, you know, for my Latin life, what like the voice would sound like, what the value would be. Um, I think like our, our buddy Jake Nomada, he basically just like emails you his Substack article. And I think, I don't know if like the whole article is in the email, or like part of it and then it links to Substack, something like that. But yeah, so he just emails out like whatever, you know, like top five cities, that type of stuff. Yeah, he's, he's got a good newsletter and, uh, and a good website. But uh, that is also written for a certain type of reader in mind, <coughs> right? The, it's, it's not for girls, right? It's for guys. Um, who are uh, who are traveling, want to party, have adventures, right, but more than just the, the content. Because I, I know you, I know you don't want to like talk about girl stuff, but um, but more than just the content, it's it's almost like for him, the writing is the final product. Like at least as of right now, it's not it's not funneling to like a high ticket course or product or anything like that. So he's basically just trying to like get you to pay for more writing, I guess. <laughs> so I guess that's a little bit of a different example. Oh no, well I. I don't know what his strategy is. I'd have to ask him. Um, I think he was just kind of doing it for fun, like a creative outlet. Uh, I don't know if he has any plan beyond that to monetize it because he's making money online other ways. So I don't know. You'd have to ask him. But uh, my, uh, my point was that he, he does have a, uh, a certain type of reader that his, his articles are aimed towards. So that is good to keep in mind as you're writing emails is like, who is my reader and what do they want to hear from me? So, and the, there's no, there's no secret to that is just, you just got to ask your audience, Hey, what do you guys want to hear about? Uh, what would you be interested in, in reading about, you know, and people will tell you and that will, it's not a, a perfect, uh, perfect data or a perfect, survey but at least it's going to get you started mm -hmm. yeah it makes sense yeah i i mean i i, I know i could kind of ask you about different aspects of email marketing for a while um maybe i should have squeaked more of that in at the beginning of the episode because <laughs> uh you are you are definitely the subject matter expert so i'll have to lean on you a little bit in the future as i get that going yeah man you just gotta get started get get into that consistent rhythm uh, don't send like 10 emails this month and one next month. Uh, a lot of people do that. So you just got to get into some kind of consistent, uh, production or output and, uh, and make sure it's something that you can maintain. Uh, and that's, that's how you start building consistency with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then one last question, I guess. So, so sort of as a email marketer and someone that really relies on a lot of the written word for the content, like, how do you think about like written word versus video versus podcasting and, and sort of the different, different mediums? I think you should do whatever works best for you. Certain people are better in certain modalities. Like some people are very good at public speaking where podcasts might make more sense. And some people are better writers. So you got to do a, a, a pick a, a modality that works for you, um, 
and also that you enjoy doing, right? Like some people have done really well with podcasts because they're talkers. Uh, some people do not want to do that. They'd rather just open up Google Docs and write. <laughs> so uh, I don't necessarily think is one that one is better than the, another for your business. Uh, although I think it is, there, there is a, an argument to be made that uh, you will build a better connection with your audience if they can consume your content in different formats. Uh, so if I can watch your videos and listen to your podcasts and read your emails and social media posts, that gives me a, um, a better, uh, better, more well-rounded impression of your business than if I was just like reading your blog posts. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So not that you have to do all those things, but I can see how, uh, it can, it can work to your advantage if you have like that kind of ecosystem built out. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I have, for example, like my YouTube is visual and audio, and then my social media is text. And so by you, the way, Dennis, are you, are you excited to hit a uh, thousand subs on the YouTube? You're, you're 25 subs away right now, 975. Oh, I didn't, I didn't even know. Uh, well, that's pretty cool. I, I've been, uh, I've been slacking on those videos because I've been trying to think about what direction I want to, I want to take the content, but yeah, that, that's a cool milestone. Yeah. There's a couple of things like when you hit a thousand that are good, obviously you can start monetization. If you have the, the hourly, uh, the view time at the watch time as well, but, uh, that's good. You'll, you'll get there probably within a month or so. Yeah, and what's cool is I haven't posted anything in a few months, but it's still growing. Mm -hmm. And that's it's the, that's the only social media platform where I see that happening. Like if you don't post on Twitter every day, you're not going to grow. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Instagram. Uh, but YouTube, it just keeps growing. So I am, I'm super bullish on YouTube as a platform. I think it's actually the best platform right now. Uh, and... Long term, that's where where I would put my focus, but I, that's me. Agreed, agreed. Um, well, yeah, we can we can definitely start wrapping up, man, because we we did hit the the one hour mark, and I, I know your time is valuable. Um, is there any sort of uh, last questions or topics that you wanted to go over before we uh, get into an outro? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Depends what what your audience wants to hear. Um, like if they're interested in the in the freelance stuff or doing what I do or learning more about that, they can look me up on my website and um, you'll see links to all my socials and my newsletter and uh, some paid products and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the email kit community, the private community. Yeah, so uh, one of my offers is my uh, private paid community, which is called email kit. It's specifically for um, people interested in learning email marketing. So right now it's mostly freelance email marketers, uh, kind of mixed. Some of them work with coaches and course creators. Some of them work with e-commerce brands. But um, yeah, there's tons of uh, content and training there, multiple courses, multiple workshops, multiple interviews with industry experts. Uh, training videos, articles, uh, monthly Q and A calls for the whole group. Um, people also get a, a private one-on-one uh, -on -one call with me when they join. So uh, I've built it to be as comprehensive as possible, so that uh, when someone joins, they have everything they need to uh, get clients and make money and, and grow their business. Uh, and that's kind of like a, a, a bit of a brain dump for me too, where I just put everything I know in there. So I do share lots of stuff on social media, uh, but I try to put as much as possible inside email kit. Yeah, this seems uh, really comprehensive, a lot of stuff in here. Yeah, 
It is. It is. Like, like I said, there's multiple courses in there and, uh, I cover pretty much every topic you'd, you'd want to hear about. So uh, it's all in there if people want to take advantage of that. Sweet. And I'm kind of looking at the, the copy on the email kit website and looking at your uh, clients that you've worked with. And what's cool is it, it seems to span kind of a lot of different industries online, right? There's um, sort of like what, what sounds like survival type businesses. There's a Scientology or Clientology. I thought that said Scientology. Clientology. That's a good one. Um, but yeah, like uh, uh, what's it called? Like working out and stuff, athletic stuff, um, uh, like international macroeconomic type stuff. So you've had a, you, you, you don't stick to one industry. You help lots of different people with their email marketing. Yeah, I tend to work with coaches and course creators, but at the same time, like marketing is marketing. Mm -hmm. And uh, email is email. Like those things don't change too much. So my clients usually sell some type of coaching or or, co or course. Um, so the um, the content is going to be a bit different, but I understand that business model, and uh, those clients will usually fall fall into that bucket of coaching and info products. So, um, so that, yeah, that tends to be who I work with, but it's, it's been a few years now. So you end up working with clients in different industries. And, um, at this point I've worked with probably, uh, I don't know, 15 or so different industries. Mm -hmm. And so do you, do you help people grow their, uh, email list as well, or just focusing on, you know, extracting as much valuable value as possible from the, from, uh, the list as is. Yeah. I focus mainly on, on monetization. So I don't really get involved with list growth. I can give some pointers, but that's not my thing. Uh, when I work with clients, they already have an established list. So I'm not the list growth guy. Um, I'm a better fit for clients that have that list and are looking for ways to make more money with it um, and retain clients. So that's, that's where I tend to focus. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Um, one or two random questions here. The, the church of clientology, which I was uh, tripping over my words there, Ryan Booth is the um, Canadian guy who uh, was in the Ukraine, right? Yeah. He runs that business with his partner, Ben. Uh, they were, I think it was about, they were clients about a year ago. So I helped them with some of their email stuff um, for one of their, I think one of the programs. But yeah, he, he also, he's been doing this, uh, this stuff we've been talking about, um, running his own online business and living abroad. And he was in Ukraine for a while, uh, but uh, he left because of the situation there right now. So I don't know where he is exactly, but um, he's also a good guy to follow. Um, yeah, he's a cool he's guy. I think, ben I think he knows the, the OG Vance uh, pretty well. Yeah. Um, okay, and then one more random question. Uh, what is Agora Affiliates with like Casey Research and stuff? I don't know if this is the same thing, but Jake had me look into this group called Agora that was sort of like a, a very – if I remember correctly, it was sort of like a private email list about maybe like investing in Colombia and stuff like that. And I, I never really cracked what it was, but I, I remember being like, huh, this is something I need to come back to. Well, I, I don't know about Colombia, but there's a company called Agora Financial out of Baltimore and they're a big financial publisher and a lot of copywriters work with them. So they also have uh, what they call affiliates or, or divisions. So there's like the main agora financial company but there are other companies that are like within that network um like some that i've listed on that page you're looking at like legacy research so i work with some of those companies and um and is it like they, a really expensive email list to be on that, that kind of thing well, like an expensive newsletter community well they they have a ton of, of free newsletters and then they will sell uh paid newsletters that are um, 
at, at various price points. Some of them are, are more expensive. And I think something was like, and they were building, they were building like private communities. Like they were like building like subdivisions in Colombia or Panama or something. And it was like, if you're on this email list, you know, you might get early access to like buy into our, our, our new community and buy like a little house or something. <laughs> I I don't know. I don't know. Okay. They're all about finance and investments, but um, <laughs> maybe. I don't know about that stuff. Okay. Sorry. Sometimes I just got to satisfy my curiosity here. Um, no, but that's awesome, man. So it sounds like a lot of your, your business and, and connections have come through Twitter, though. Uh, you've, been, you've been in the Twitter sphere for a while. Yeah, I've been on there for like 10 years, but uh, I also spent a lot of time on Facebook. Facebook's great for business contacts. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've met a lot of people through Facebook. I know some people on Twitter hate Facebook and people on Facebook hate Twitter, but both are good platforms. There's a lot of successful business owners and a lot of uh, potential clients on both platforms. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm active on both. Not so much on Facebook lately, but I, um, I still spend probably majority of my time on, on both of those platforms. Okay. Awesome, man. Yeah. It, it was really great today to, to have the opportunity to finally speak with you. You know, you've been, uh, you know, supporting my Latin life for a while. We've been, uh, supporting each other on Twitter and hope to continue doing that in the future. And it was great to learn a little bit more about what you're working on. Yeah, man. I appreciate you inviting me. So, um, likewise, great, to, great to talk. Absolutely. This is my first pod in a while. So, well, shaking off the rust, but, uh, you know, it was good to, I, I definitely felt like, uh, very comfortable speaking with you. I, you know, I know you've had a uh, other podcast in the p- past and, uh, it showed you did a great job. Thanks. Appreciate it. Awesome, man. Um, uh, well, thanks again. And you know, well, uh, <laughs> I'll see you on Twitter, I guess. See you on Twitter. Sounds good. <laughs>